But so last week, I began a a short series that I called parent-driven or parent-promise-driven parenting. And honestly, when I wrote that sermon, I had planned on just preaching one sermon on parenting and our children and their place uh, in the church and in the covenant and our lives and our families. Um, But as I was writing that sermon, all of these other themes and all of these other ideas just started popping into my head because the Bible has an amazing amount of information uh, regarding our children. The Bible has much to say about our children as believers and their place in the covenant and in the church and in the, the kingdom. And not only that, but God, I saw, had made promises, not just to us as his people, but to our children. God has made promises to you and to your children because they are heirs of the covenant. They are the offspring of believers. And so what I saw was that that single sermon on parenting and our children really became a a labyrinth, an unending labyrinth of, of avenues and points regarding our children. And so what I want to do today and and most likely next week is I want to continue uh, the theme of promise-driven parenting as we consider our children. And if you remember last week, I began by showing us what our children are to us from the Lord. And I showed us from Psalm 127 that our children, according to the scriptures, are a reward. They're a heritage. They're a gift from our Father in heaven. But not only that, but we saw that they are arrows in the hands of a warrior and in the, in the quiver of a warrior. And these arrows are to be sharpened. They're to be trained up and, and put to a bowstring and shot out into the world and into the church. And that happens. The, the sharpening of these arrows happens through discipleship in the homes. And I gave us some different ways of, of doing that uh, as parents. But then I ended that message, and I promised that I would continue this theme. I ended that message by asking the question, what is our confidence as parents that all of our work in discipleship and training up in the home and bringing them to church and and having them around the Lord's people and his word, what is our hope and confidence that we're not working in vain? That our lives are not a waste. Why should we not just wait until they are 18 and then have them figure out for themselves what they want to do? And I showed us that the Bible forbids that. The Bible commands us to raise up our children in the Lord. And underneath of that command is a foundational promise that God has made promises not just to us, but also to our children. And what this means, this is really earth shattering, or it should be. Because what this means is that God, the God of the Bible, he does not just deal with believers, but he deals with believers and their children, and in many cases, their entire households. God consistently, from Genesis to Revelation, deals with, with the people of God, not just in an individualistic kind of sense, but in a corporate sense and in family solidarity. So what I want to do today is I want to pick up this theme to you and your children regarding the promises of God. And I want us to see from Genesis on that this is the pattern in Scripture and not just in the Old Covenant, but also in the new covenant. So that's the game plan today. I want to begin in Genesis, in chapter 9. I want you to see the beginning of this pattern. I want to trace it through the Bible. And then I want to end by giving us a glorious example of this in the New Testament that I think will be uh, really special for mothers on Mother's Day. So I want us to see first that when God enters into a covenant relationship with his people, He does not just enter into an individualistic relationship, but he enters into a relationship with his people, believers, a relationship that involves the children and many, um, their children and their households. Genesis chapter 9, 8 and 9, it says this, Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, Behold, I establish my covenant with you 
and your offspring after you. And notice there that it's not just Noah, but the covenant is established with Noah and his offspring. And then keep in mind that after Noah builds the ark that God commands him to build, who goes into the ark with Noah? His entire household, his family, not just Noah, who is the one who has seemed to be righteous before God in the scriptures. The Bible doesn't say anything about his children or his wife believing or being righteous by faith. The emphasis is on Noah. And we see that in Genesis and in Hebrews chapter 11. Genesis 7, 1 says this, Then the Lord said to Noah, Go into the ark, you and all your household, for I have seen that you are righteous, that you, Noah, are righteous before me in this generation. So God clearly deals with Noah because he is righteous by faith. But then because of Noah's family's relationship to Noah, under his covenant headship as the head of the house, his entire family is established in this covenant. This is a very important thing to see. And I want us to see that it becomes the pattern of God in the scriptures. And this pattern continues not just with Noah, but then with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Genesis 13, starting in verse 15. It says, The Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, Lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward and southward and eastward and westward, for all the land that you see. This is the promised land. All the land that you see, I will give it to you and to your offspring after you. Again, the promise is not just for Abram, but it is for Abram and his children. Abram and his offspring. Genesis 15, 18. It says, when the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. This is God entering into covenant with Abram. If you remember that sermon from long ago in the, the series that we did. But it says then, verse 18, on that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram saying to your offspring, I will give this land from the river of Egypt, to the great river, the river Euphrates. And then this theme, this covenant with Abram, who is later renamed Abraham, it comes to a climax in chapter 17, when God gives Abram or Abraham the sign of circumcision, the covenant sign of God's promises, circumcision for Abraham and his children. Look at 17, 7. God says, and I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant. For what? This is so important. To be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Now, I want you to pay very close attention to that promise and the pattern of that promise. God did not just promise Abram that he and his offspring would get the land. It's not just a physical promise regarding a physical piece of real estate in the Middle East. But God says to Abraham that he will be God to Abraham and to his children. That's the promise. And what is the, what is the picture of that promise? What is the guarantee of that promise? How, how did they know? How is, it, how is it manifest in the world? The land. The land is the promise that manifests the fact that God will be God to Abraham and his children. And what is the sign? What is the covenant symbol of that godness to his children? Circumcision. Abraham believes he is accounted as righteous and he receives the sign of circumcision on his flesh as a sign of the promise of God to be God to him and to his offspring and to inherit the land. But it's not just placed on Abraham, but it's placed on Abraham's children from birth. And that's what we see in verses 9 through 14. 
God commands Abraham, who is circumcised, to then circumcise all of his male children because they belong to the covenant. And they were circumcised on the eighth day as covenant children. What we have to see here is that this is the beginning. In a more uh, realistic or manifest way, this is the covenant of grace. This is what is ultimately called the gospel in the New Testament, the new covenant. But I want you to see that to you and to your offspring, I will be God to you and to your offspring. I will give the land to you and to your offspring. And what is the sign or seal of that promise? Circumcision on Abraham and on Abraham's children from birth on the eighth day. So God is establishing here from the very beginning in the scriptures, he is establishing a pattern regarding his covenant relationship with his people and their children. It's not just the father. It's not just the mother. But it is the father and the mother and their children. And all of them together are marked off by the covenant sign. The story goes on, though, and we see God's faithfulness to this promise. The Bible doesn't leave us wondering if God keeps his promise to Abraham and to his offspring. What we see is that this, this promise is passed down generation after generation after generation, which means that we do see in Genesis God's faithfulness to his promise uh, to Abraham. Genesis 26, 2 and 3. This is Abraham now speaking to his own son, to Isaac. He tells Isaac, do not go down to Egypt, but dwell in the land of which I shall tell you. Sojourn in this land and I will be with you and will bless you for to you and to your offspring. I will give all these lands and I will establish the oath that I swore to Abraham, your father. This is God now speaking to Isaac regarding the promise that God made to his father, Abraham. Verse 41 I will multiply, this is verse four, sorry. I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and will give to your offspring all these lands and in your offspring all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because Abram obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes and my law. So what do we see here? We see God making a promise to Abraham and his offspring and now that Abraham has Isaac, that promise is being continued. God is now speaking to Isaac regarding he and his offspring. It is a generational promise. And it's clear that Isaac is going to receive the promise that God made to his father, Isaac. But then we see it one more time. When Jacob is spoken to by his father, Isaac, and it says this, Genesis 28, 2 and 3. It says, God Almighty bless you. And make you fruitful and multiply you that you may become a company of peoples. May he give the blessing of Abraham, your grandfather, to you and to your offspring with you. That you may take possession of the land of your sojournings that God gave to Abraham. And then in verse 13, the Lord himself speaks, confirming this blessing. And it says, And behold, the Lord Yahweh stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you, Jacob, and to your offspring. And we could go on, and we could see this pattern in, in other places. Like when God gives the law and he promises to be faithful to a thousand generations regarding his believers, his people. Or we can look at God's promise to David, the promise to David and his offspring, which you can trace down through the generations. What I want us to see in all of those passages, I want us to see that God does have a covenantal pattern when he deals with his people in the world. And that pattern in every place from Genesis on is to you and to your offspring. 
The promise is to you, believer, and to your offspring as most clearly seen in Genesis 17. And sometimes it is, it is changed to you and your house. Which is why Joshua can say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Now what right does he have to say that? Don't our children have free will? Can't they decide for themselves what they want to believe and who they want to believe? Not when they're in my house. As for me and my house, says Joshua, we will serve the Lord. That's the way God works with his people in the Bible, covenantally. Now, some might object to this, and they might say, well, that's God's pattern in the Old Testament. To you and your offspring, and the blessing being passed on, and the promises being passed on. That's just in the Old Testament, and it's just about a physical piece of land. It's, it's just about the nation of Israel. It's nothing about the New Covenant. It's nothing about what we have now. And I would say to that, you fundamentally misunderstand the Old Testament. Because the Old Testament was never just about a physical nation. It was about Israel as the Old Covenant church paving the way for the more inclusive church of the New Covenant, including the Gentiles. The land was never about the land. Otherwise, Abraham would have rejoiced in being in the land. But what does Hebrews 11 say? It says that he was looking for the land whose builder and maker is God. A heavenly land, a heavenly city, which means everything in the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, it is typological. It's pointing to something greater. The same with circumcision. Circumcision is not just a physical sign marking off a physical people for a physical land. If anyone actually reads the Old Testament, they understand, they see in Deuteronomy 10 and 30 and Jeremiah 4 and all over that physical circumcision was an outward sign of an internal reality. The circumcision of the heart, which we would call in systematic theology, regeneration. So all that we're seeing in the Old Covenant, the pattern, the promises, they are essentially gospel promises. To inherit the promised land is to inherit eternal life. It is to inherit Eden again. It is a picture of the heavenly kingdom. To be circumcised and cut off from all the other nations of the world is to be regenerated and set apart for God. So to say that all of this, this pattern and this sign and this people and this land is just physical and has nothing to do with the new covenant I think is a misunderstanding of the entire Bible and the purpose of Israel and the land and circumcision. And so if that's true, if what I just said is true, and that this, these promises and these signs and this location was ultimately about something greater, then we should expect to see that translated or, or transferred into the new covenant. We should see this promise transferred into the new covenant, not just staying in the old covenant. We should see a new kind of circumcision. We should see a new kind of land as the focus. And do we? Yes, we do. And in fact, the prophets prepare us for this before the new covenant actually comes with Christ. For example, Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 6. Clearly a new covenant promise. Because it occurs after the, the, the curses of exile and, and going into judgment, death, and resurrection after exile. It says this, Deuteronomy 30, verse 6. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring. There's the pattern again. So that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, that you may Live. That's the real purpose of circumcision. That's what it points to. And that is a new covenant promise. And what pattern do you see in this new covenant promise? To you and your offspring. I will circumcise your heart, believer, and I will circumcise the heart of your children. It is not just a physical reality here, but it is a spiritual reality. It is a promise from God that he will regenerate. 
not just believers, but even their children. Again, Ezekiel 37, another new covenant promise regarding believers and their children. Ezekiel 37, 24 through 28. It says, my servant David, and keep in mind, David's been dead for a long time. My servant David shall be king over them, and they shall have one shepherd. They shall walk in my rules and be careful to obey my statutes. They shall dwell in the land that I gave to my servant Jacob, where your fathers lived. They and their children and their children, their children's children shall dwell there forever. And David, my servant, shall be their prince forever. And I will make a covenant of peace with them. That's the new covenant. And it shall be an everlasting covenant with them. And I will set them in their lands and multiply them. And I will set my sanctuary in their midst forever. My dwelling place shall be with them. And I will be their God. And they shall be my people. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord who sanctifies Israel when my sanctuary is in their midst forever. This is a new covenant promise. It's not a promise to physical Israel about their land. It is a promise to spiritual Israel and the children of spiritual Israel and the grandchildren of spiritual Israel relating to God who is their God. In the heavenly realm, which is typified in the land of Canaan. And how do we know this is a new covenant promise? Because David's been dead. And there's a greater David coming, who is Christ. This covenant promise is a new covenant promise about Christ and his people. And this promise includes they and their children and their children's children. And there are other passages like this. Isaiah 59, 21, you could write that down, look at that later. It's very much like the Ezekiel 37 one. But the point I'm laboring to show us here is that when God makes promises in the scriptures, promises regarding salvation and eternal life, he does not just make promises to his believing people, but he makes promises to believers and their children. And it's not just in the Old Covenant but we're seeing the prophecies and the promises in the new covenant prophecies as well. But does this show up in the New Testament? Does this show up obviously in the New Testament? Is this promise carried on? And can you find a place in the New Testament where we see it? And the answer is in the most obvious place that you might have missed it. Acts 2, on the day of Pentecost. When the Holy Spirit is poured out from heaven, from the Father, and from the Son, after Jesus has lived and died and has been raised in glory, on that day, listen to what is said. Peter stands up. He's preaching to 3,000 men. And it is men. It's not people. It's not anthropoi. It's andros. Men. Very clearly men. Heads of households. And listen. Listen. Acts 2, 37. Now, when they heard this, these 3,000 men, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promise, listen up, the promise is for you and for your children. Have you seen that before? Now you have. You've seen it all over the place. The promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. The point here is that this pattern continues in the New Testament and it continues in Acts 2 on the day of Pentecost, when the Spirit is poured out. And what is the promise? What is the promise that is for you and your children? Well, very clearly, if you read the, the end of Luke 24 and the opening of Acts, it is the Holy Spirit himself. He is the promised Holy Spirit, the promise of the Father, Luke 24, 49, and Acts 1, 4. And according to the Apostle Paul, this promise, the Holy Spirit, 
Galatians 3.14, it was the promise that was made to Abraham and his offspring in, in Genesis chapter 12. So I know that was a lot. I know it was a lot of Bible. I know it was a lot of um, flipping. But here's the thing. Is that this is so clear in the scriptures. And I'm afraid that many of us have missed it. And what do I mean by that? What I mean is, is that we treat our children no different than the world treats their children. We think that we are believers and it's an individualistic kind of thing between us and God. And we leave it up to our children to figure it out on their own when they're ready. But that is not how God addresses us. And it's not how God speak to us, speaks to us in his word regarding us and our children. But he makes promises to them because of us and because of his ancient decree. So what does this mean? It means that our children, church, our children are set apart as children of the covenant as children of the covenant promises, and they are not just like the children of the world. There's this weird passage in 1 Corinthians 7 where Paul says, he's talking about a believing husband and an unbelieving wife and how she's sanctified by her husband. Believing wife, unbelieving husband, he's sanctified by her. But then he ends that little section by talking about the children of that believer and that unbeliever. And he essentially says that if it was not for that believing parent, that child would be deemed unclean. But as it is, meaning with a believing parent or two believing parents, that child is holy. And what does that mean? Holy means set apart. The children of believers are set apart from the world. They are set apart from all the other unbelieving children at school. Our children are set apart by God as covenant children with covenant promises because they, belay, they belong to a covenant family. What's interesting to me is that this is exactly how Peter treats the Jews, all of the covenant children of Abraham. Listen to what he says in Acts chapter 3 when he's preaching the gospel to them. Acts chapter 3, 24 through 26. He says, And all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel and those who came after him also proclaimed these days. What days? Gospel days. New covenant days. And listen to what he says to them. Verse 25, he says, You are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant. That is how Peter addresses these Jews who belong to the covenant promise made to Abraham. You are sons of the covenant that God made with your fathers, saying to Abraham, and in your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. God, having raised up his servant, sent him to you first to bless you by turning every one of you from your wickedness. Do you see how Peter treats these Jews? Yes, they're unbelieving right now. But he makes it clear in this text that they are sons of the covenant. And because of that, the gospel has come to them first. Do you wonder why you see this pattern in Paul to the Jew first and then to the Gentile? It's because they're covenant children. That's why. Paul addresses this again in Romans 9 regarding the Jews. Romans 9, 3 and 4, he says, For I wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. What's he saying? He says that they are covenantally set apart with a distinct relationship to God. And now they have a choice to make. They will either be raised up and grow up and walk in that covenant in faith and in belief like their father Abraham. 
And they will inherit all the promises and all the blessings which have been promised to them as covenant children. Or they will walk away from the covenant. They will be cut off and they will suffer eternal wrath. What Paul is not saying here is that these Jews are good because they belong to covenant families. He's not saying that at all. And if they don't repent and believe, they're damned forever. Being a part of a covenant family doesn't necessarily make you saved. But what it means is that God has made promises to our children and that he very typically and regularly works through our children, making them the next generation of God's people who will stand in our place. And this pattern is not just for the Jews who are typological and pointing to all of God's people, but it is for all of us. It is for every believer and their children. That's the pattern in scriptures, the scriptures. And so if that's true, then we should expect that when we talk about the church, which is God's people on earth, we should expect to see not the exclusion of our children, but the inclusion of them. And I want to pick up on that next Sunday, but that is exactly what we see. Because they are covenant children who belong to covenant families, whenever God calls his congregation together, he doesn't just call the fathers and the mothers, but he calls the entire family. And not only in the Old Testament, but we're going to see that even Paul himself, when he writes, he addresses the entire family, even little children. And not only Paul, but Jesus himself will take up a little infant in his arms, bless it, and say that the kingdom belongs to such as these covenant children. So you can see that the Bible has much to say about our children, believers. And it should give us a lot of hope and a lot of confidence that our work isn't in vain as we drag them to this place every Sunday. And as we fight with them in the chairs, we listen to their screaming and their cooing. That is the sound of the next generation of God's people. And he expects them to be here. He expects them to be in this place receiving the means of grace, his word, But with that pattern established, seeing how God works through his people and through their children, I want us to end this morning by seeing a glorious illustration of this very concept and of this very pattern in the New Testament. 2 Timothy chapter 1. Paul here is speaking to young pastor Timothy. And I want you to listen to this passage today with new ears in light of everything that we've just seen from Genesis on, even into Acts 2. Listen to what Paul says very carefully and think back about why he can say what he's saying. Paul says, 2 Timothy 1, verses 3 through 5. He says, I thank God whom I serve as did my ancestors. With a clear conscience, as I remember you constantly in my prayers, night and day, Timothy, as I remember your tears, I long to see you, that I may be filled with joy. Paul is speaking to his son, his son in the faith. But listen to what he says, verse 5. Paul says, I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother. Your grandmother, Lois, and your mother, Eunice. And now I am sure that it dwells in you. what Paul's just done there. He took the old pattern to you and to your offspring and he says, Timothy, you are evidence that it's true. Your grandma,
This is how God works. And this is what God promises to our children. Do you look at them this way? I get so tired of my Baptist friends. I love them so much. I love my Baptist friends, and I have lots of them. But I'll tell you what. They are utterly inconsistent when they look at their children in light of what they really believe about their children. From their point of view, their children are born as, as my friend Derek would say, vipers in diapers who deserve wrath and judgment and hell. And that's true to a point. But when the scriptures talks about our children, believers, they aren't just vipers and diapers, but they are children of the covenant to whom God has made promises. Those whom we should expect will rise up as believers who will walk within the covenant all of their days. Lois believed, Eunice believed, and now Timothy. And he says, this faith once dwelt in your grandmother, and then your mother, and now it's in you. That is the covenant faithfulness of God to you and to your offspring. This is the, the normative covenant pattern and this should be a rock under our feet as parents when we look into the eyes of our children and we try to disciple them as those who belong to the covenant mothers and fathers take heart your work is not in vain your work and your prayers for your children are rooted in an immutable unchangeable promise from God most high When you look at your children, believers, you should expect them to grow up walking in the Lord. That should be your expectation. You should, be, you should believe that they will grow up believing in his life, death, and resurrection. Christ's in their place. As those who will carry forward the glory torch of the gospel. I want to close with a quote from Spurgeon. He says, oh, dear mothers, he says, you have a very sacred trust reposed in you by God. He hath in effect said to you, take this child and nurse it for me, and I will give thee thy wages. You are called to equip the future man of God that he may be thoroughly furnished unto every good work. If God spares you, you may live to hear that boy speak to thousands, and you will have the sweet reflection in your heart that the quiet teachings of the nursery led the man to love his God and serve him. Those who think that a woman detained at home by her little family is doing nothing think the reverse of what is true. Scarcely can the godly mother quit her home for a place of worship, but dream not that she has lost to the work of the church. Far from it. She is doing the best possible service for her Lord. Mothers, the godly training of your offspring is your first and most pressing duty. And when you go after this work, Know that God will bless it because he has promised. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that this pattern, that all that scripture says about you and your working in our lives and in the lives of our children, I pray that, that it would penetrate deep into our hearts, Lord. I pray, Lord, that we would consider our children differently that we would think about our children differently. That we would see that you have made promises not just to us but to them and that we should expect you to be at work in their hearts from birth. Lord, I pray that you would save all of our children, that you would regenerate them. 
I pray that many would be regenerated now, even from birth, by your grace, like John the Baptist. Lord, help us to believe that you can do far more abundantly than all that we think or ask. We praise you. We love you. We give you glory and honor. Now do a great work in our lives and in our families' lives. Pray this all in Jesus' name.